welcome to Fertility and Sterility on Air, the podcast where you can stay current on the latest global research in the field of reproductive medicine. This podcast brings you an overview of this month's journal, in-depth discussion with authors, and other special features. FNS on Air is brought to you by Fertility and Sterility Family of Journals in conjunction with the American Society for Reproductive Medicine and is hosted by Dr. Kurt Barnhart, Editor-in-Chief, Dr. Eve Feinberg, Editorial Editor, Dr. Micah Hill, Media Editor, and Dr. Pietro Bordaletto, Interactive Associate-in-Chief. Welcome to all of our listeners to Fertility and Sterility on Air. I'm Micah Hill, our media editor, and we're on the December edition of FNS on Air, volume 120, number six. We're actually recording this the week of Thanksgiving, and I'm thankful for our co-hosts. We have three of the regular four of us. Good morning, Eve. Good morning, Kurt. Good morning, Micah. Good morning, Micah. And unfortunately, Pietro is not with us today, but we're excited to uh, introduce one of our new co-hosts of FNS on Air, Kate Devine. Kate, say hi to our listeners and uh, give us a couple sentences so they can know a little bit about you. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here and to be here with our listeners as well as with the three of you. I'm an REI in Washington, D.C. I practice at Shady Grove Fertility and work with some of the fellows from the NIH and a few other fellowships across the country and just excited to have the opportunity to discuss science with everybody this morning. Excellent. We're, Welcome, Kate. You welcome. may know Kate we're, from some of the recent randomized trials like Synchrony and Sustain, and she's been doing some incredible research. And uh, Eve, you had something you were going to say too. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, it's okay. I was just going to say welcome. We're excited to have you on board. Thank you. All right. So we're going to jump right in. We have, as always, some front matter in the journal before we get to the original science. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. We have our views and reviews this month. It's from one of our editorial editors, Michael Eisenberg, a male reproductive urologist. And he looks at lifestyle modifications for uh, male fertility, too much or not enough. What does the evidence say? He put together four really nice articles from leading uh, epidemiologists and researchers around the country, looking at things like diet and recreational drug, obesity, medication supplements, and even endocrine disrupting chemicals and their effects on male reproductive health, and really what should we be counseling our patients about? I'll let you read it, but essentially he concludes similar to what ASRM and uh, AUA say in their statements that really we're, we don't have great evidence that lifestyle modifications will impact male fertility, but we do have evidences of association and we, we want to counsel on good lifestyle and health overall to improve uh, general reproductive health. So four very good articles there in the views and reviews. We also have a fertile battle from our editorial editor, Laura Rizzini, and this is looking at what do we do with day seven blasts or poor quality embryos, poor quality blasts. Should we be thawing these, freezing these, thawing these? Should we be discarding them and just trying to get better embryos? Uh, and they do a battle on both the pro and the con side of freezing these sort of borderline embryos. And how do we even define borderline embryos? And can we improve this uh, in the future with AI? Will AI be help, able to help us uh, make better decisions with what to do with these embryos? And then we get to the inklings. And so this is one we want to spend a little bit more time talking about. Uh, this is actually from our editor-in-chief, Kurt Barnhart. It's titled, The Hero and the Villain, Participation in Clinical Trials and the Crime of Fabrication. Kurt, about once a year, you address the uh, readers of our journal as editor-in-chief. Uh, what was so important about this topic that you decided to, to address this this year? I love the way you made that title sound dramatic, Micah. It was very impressive. Um, <laughs> so this inkling was uh, kind of my thought process to call out the real heroes of uh, scientific research, which is the in, in our field, the women that participate in clinical trials. For those of us that understand how hard a clinical trial is to conduct from the logistic aspects of the design and all the regulations, I think the unsung hero is the, is the woman or the couple that participates in this trial. And what I tried to point out was they are are really often altruistic. They give up a lot of control. They often have more intervention than they would normally get if they just chose their intervention. And it gives our field so much. I mean, as you mentioned at the beginning, the randomized trials really are the epitome of evidence. And the fact that these women give so much to be in a trial, the fact, and it just, it's so audacious and bothers me so much, the fact that we are now uncovering that 
a lot of clinical trials published in literature and in fertility and sterility over the years have never happened. They were, they literally were fabricated. The data was made up. It is such a crime to the women who do participate in the trial. It's a crime to the science as we, as we try to synthesize what might be a fabricated trial with a real trial. And I just, you know, to make it dramatic, Mike, I, I can't understand the logic of someone who would uh, stoop to such a level to literally make up a trial. And that's what I was trying to convey in this inkling. Yeah, and I think uh, conveyed very well. It actually opened my eyes because I hadn't thought about it from the standpoint of the women patients who do choose to participate in, in clinical trials and, and volunteer that time and, and potential risk to themselves. I had thought about it at the risk for future patients and doing bad evidence-based medicine that shouldn't really be. But uh, yeah, as I hadn't thought about it, Kurt, that opened my eyes. Yeah, it's the ultimate you know, sacrifice in ethics to give up control to a computer randomization to um, uh, an idea of, a tr- of an uh, intervention that may work but may not. It's, it's really an interesting dynamic to be able to participate in that. So again, thank you to all the trials that did. I know many of us on this podcast have conducted trials, and um, it, it's amazing to go through that process. And thank you to all the women and couples that do join us. Great. Thank you, Kurt. And Kurt, we're coming right back to you as we start to dive into the science now, the seminal uh, contribution this month on non-euploid embryos and rebiopsy. Yeah, thank you very much. A seminal contribution is I try to pick out articles that will garner the most, I guess, controversy or or conversation or at least impact to the field. Uh, and this is one that I think we probably have a lot to say about. So the article itself is titled... Blinded rebiopsy and analysis of non-euploid embryos with two distinct pre-implantation genetic testing platforms for aneuploidy. Well done study by Sarah Casante is the first author and Jamie Griffo. This kind of study is hard to describe in the abstract. And I noticed rereading this after it was accepted that it's not exactly characterized as the kind of study it is. It's it's not a prospective study. What this is is really is, is a, um, an assessment of a diagnostic test. Um, what they're trying to do here is um, look at a diagnosis and then evaluate it with a second way to make the diagnosis and see if the results are actually concordant. So the goal here is to determine how often a non-euploid result from a single trophectoderm biopsy, which was uh, initially tested with next generation sequencing was you got the same result uh, or a different result with, let's just call it an updated platform, next generation sequencing with single nucleotide polymorphism array based addition to it. Interesting idea because because the, the field is moving forward this way. Basically, the idea is that we have a perhaps better or more sensitive platform. So what this study did in a really nice study is they took 100 donated embryos of various diagnoses by um, by PGTA uh, and they rebiopsied them. Actually, they rebiopsied them multiple times and then also took the rest of the embryo and also analyzed that. So in a sense, you have four readings. You have the initial reading and then you have three different biopsies that would have been done in a clinical fashion with the new platform uh, and then the whole embryo. And they basically wanted to see how often the results were the same or different. So again, this is going to be complicated because we're going to get stuck in all the the lingo here and my apologies for mispronouncing it. But what they did was they took a variety of um, underlying quote unquote abnormalities. So out of the 100 embryos, They had 40 that had at least one whole chromosome full copy aneuploidy. 20 of those had a single whole chromosome intermediate copy number or a mosaic. But they also looked at single full segmental aneuploidy in the whole chromosome and also single segmental intermediate copy number or mosaic. So there's there's four groups. There's I got the whole chromosome that, that they said was wrong. I got the whole chromosome that was wrong, but only in some of the the cells, i.e. a mosaic. Then you looked at um, segmental defects, and there were segmental defects found in the whole chromosome, and then there were segmental defects found in some of the chromosomes, i.e. aneuploidy. So as we might expect, the results were not exactly the same depending on what your diagnosis was. The conclusion of this study was that there was very high concordance of the NGS platform and the NGS microarray SNP platform with whole chromosome aneuploidy, but there was not very good chromosomes in most of the other other diagnoses made. Now, this is where it's going to get interesting because the the words chosen to describe the results really depend on your bias and how you how you're going to describe these results. So, the same numeric number is going to say is really great in one person's eyes and really poor in another person's eyes. But let me let me see if I can describe it to you, and then we can decide what we're talking about in terms of some of those answers. 
let's go back and, and re-clarify some of the methods before we get into the numbers. So again, four samples were collected from each embryo. And as I mentioned, three of them were, were quote, clinical sized biopsies, as you would do in the, in the, um, in the clinic for, for PGATS samples, whereas one was um, the whole embryo. It, it assesses basically an involvement in the field where many of us are using NGS as the platform to determine the, the copy number. However, on top of this, um, you can add what's called a SNP array to, to find out more specifically the copy number. So basically, what you're doing is the, the SNP array based PGT platform uses machine learning algorithms to determine the copy number with allele ratio analyses. In other words, it looks at an array of SNPs across the chromosome. And by having those individual polymorphisms across the chromosome, it can actually not only count the chromosome material, but the expected number of array or of SNPs that you might see, therefore getting a better idea whether the copy number is correct or partially background noise. So the idea is the SNP array will help you determine whether you have the correct copy number and is less likely to give you a mosaic answer. It produces only three possible results, euploid, whole chromosome aneuploidy, or segmental aneuploidy, and intermediate copy number of such as whole chromosome mosaicism or segmental mosaicism is not reported. The top level answer that you should know is probably what we're most concerned about, which is the whole chromosome aneuploidy. In this case, what the study found was that the newer array with the SNP array found two normal embryos that were called abnormal by NGS. So out of the 20, they found, or actually 40, depending how you put this together, they found two that were miscalled or falsely negative, I guess, or falsely positive, the way you put about it, but falsely called aneuploid when they were actually euploid. So they said the concordance was 95%. And let's analyze that for a second. Is that good or bad? They say that it's highly concordant. I would say I'm not so sure that is so concordant, uh, especially when you look at a confidence interval that can say it's as low as 83% or as accurate as 99%. So basically what you're saying is one in 20 embryos is incorrectly diagnosed by your PGTA platform currently as judged by a quote unquote more sensitive platform. So again, I don't know what you guys feel about that answer. The, the, the bias in this paper was that was a very positive result, but I might argue that that strikes me as not so positive. What do you guys think about that? I mean, I guess what I wonder about is why are they calling that incorrectly labeled as opposed to saying, you know what, this represents mosaicism, that now you have two different cell lines that are present with, within one embryo. And I think we know, like, not every euploid embryo implants, and could that potentially be a reason as to why? Like, I did not read that as a misdiagnosis, except to say they misdiagnosed the mosaicism. Like, why are we calling that now, aneuploid? Before I get too far in this, th this is not a mosaicism. This is aneuploid. They said that there were 40 embryos they tested that by PGTA were aneuploid had an extra or missing a chromosome. When they retested it with the other platform four different times, they said it was normal. So they're calling that one a falsely positive diagnosed, meaning they the PGTA was overcalled. They said it was an abnormal embryo when it was normal. We're not talking about mosaicism. We're not talking about um, segmental respect. We're saying they literally got the diagnosis wrong. Well, no, I know that that's what they're saying, but you can't go back and buy it. They're not biopsying the exact same cells that they tested originally. So in the original cells that they tested, those cells were euploid. They then went back and they extracted additional cells from that embryo, which were then red. Actually, it was the other way around. The original cells were red as aneuploid. And then they went back and they biopsied and they said, oh, no, no, that was wrong. It's euploid. My read on it is, well, couldn't that be mosaic? That one reading showed that those cells were normal. Subsequent readings showed the opposite. And that embryo now potentially could contain two cell lines. I think that's unlikely to be the cause. But even if it was, it doesn't change the diagnostic accuracy of the test, right? Because the test is saying, don't transfer these embryos. They're aneuploid. The test was wrong, whether it was because of mosaicism or it was just wrong on the four repeat cell line biopsies. Yeah, and I guess regardless of how it got my... there, the test is still wrong and it's saying don't transfer the embryo. Which if that's happening at that percent is what is Kurt saying, how many misdiagnosed embryos are we not transferring that we could? I guess hey, that's please I would, yeah, I would agree. And you know, the main goal 
of PGTA for a huge proportion of our patients is to have an extremely low false positive rate, right? We really, really want to avoid embryo wastage for these patients. And that's the most favorable diagnostic category in this paper. It all goes downhill from there when you talk about the ones that had a less clear call initially. And so I honestly think that this conversation dovetails very nicely with one that was in, I believe, last month's podcast talking about really maybe all patients should be counseled the same. That is essentially uh, that PGTA is absolutely a screening test. And um, while we should probably be using it to deselect those with a clear call, this calls even that into question, even though that's not the way the authors interpreted those data. Yeah. I mean, I agree. I think that, I think that we can't look at it as an absolute, right? Like it is a screening test. And I think the scariest part about it is we layer a screening test upon another screening test when we have a euploid result. But when we have a mosaic result, we insist that we do a diagnostic test after a screening test. So for example, if you have a euploid embryo, we generally counsel those patients that knit that non-invasive prenatal testing is okay. But if we have a mosaic embryo, we tell those patients that they need to do some form of diagnostic testing, either CVS or amniocentesis. And I think that that argument is a little bit flawed. All right, let's dive into a little bit more of the data because I think it actually shows that um, how complicated this gets really quickly. So what we just discussed was supposedly the most straightforward answer. Do we have the right number of chromosomes? Now let's delve into the number of embryos they looked at purposely with a softer call. For example, whole chromosome mosaic. So in some of the cells in the initial biopsy, the chromosome number was normal. In some of the cells in the initial biopsy with the NGS platform, the cells were, were euploid. So these were rebiopsied with a new platform, and they found out 35% they were called euploid, and at 15% on all conclusive biopsies, they were called aneuploid. So therefore, the aneuploid result we're getting in most of our testing now is very difficult to interpret. They basically are saying at least a third of them are normal, and only about 15% are abnormal, but you have no way of telling that, right? And by the way, I looked at this paper twice and I can't find the intervening 55% and because the, what that results is something called a chaotic answer, meaning that every biopsy got a different answer. So they weren't able to categorize it. So it's, it's a very difficult condition to say, but my interpretation is the whole chromosome mosaic is not a correct call. In other words, that test has got too much noise, and we really don't know what that answer is, which begs the question of what do you do with that result? What do you guys think of that? Yeah, I agree with that interpretation. I do think most of us now are, are allowing patients to transfer those embryos. That said, it's becoming more and more muddy, and I do think that it's essentially, essentially akin to a no call. And I think a lot of the less clear diagnostic categories, other than just euploid and just PGTA are becoming more and more akin to a no call. And it makes me particularly apprehensive about discarding embryos. So it's a little bit of a tangential conversation, but I do think it's something that becomes increasingly in focus the more data we uh, accumulate. I agree. And let me give you the last category of data, and then we'll go talk about it even further. The next question they looked at was even the softer of the softer calls, which is that you have a segmental defect either on a whole chromosome or a segmental defect that's mosaic in some of the biopsies you got. And in this case, when they rebiopsied, they were getting 30% of the embryos with a segmental aneuploid and 65% of those with the segmental mosaicism were euploid. So that one again is saying it's probably a incorrect call, meaning that the finding is not quote unquote abnormal. Although some of, some of them, it, it obviously is truly um, saying something is wrong. So let me give you, th this is the author's words, because they tried to summarize this complex data for it. So they were trying to flip it a different way. So in 13% of embryos with NG NGS diagnosed full copy aneuploid, and 50% of the embryos with mosaic had uniformly normal results. They basically saying the this new SNP array was correcting a misdiagnosis of as much as 13% and 50% in standard NGS platforms. That, that was just astounding to me to, to, to basically say that. But they were trying to also point out in a positive way, conversely, all embryos with at least one non-euploid result had either 
the SNP diagnose confirmed it or the NGS diagnosis had some abnormality, whether it's mosaic or not mosaic, on the same chromosome. So they're trying to say that they were at least getting close to finding all true aneuploidy. All right, we just had a complex conversation here about this. And basically my take on it was, we're trying to find aneuploidy. And by the NGS platform, we're, we are overcalling 5% of embryos, which is a lot. And the other calls that we're getting, whether it's mosaicism or, or segmental abnormalities, whether they're mosaic or not, are really very difficult to interpret, whereas a large majority of those are going to be normal, but not all of them. So it really begs the question to me, why are we biopsying these embryos? Because their conclusion is basically saying it reinforced that embryos have reproductive potential and may be suitable for transfer. So if most of the calls you're making are suitable for transfer, why are you making the call? So it re really begs in my mind, and I know I'm on the one side of the spectrum, I'm not convinced that biopsying these embryos is doing a lot to help a woman decide which embryo to put back, uh, especially if the vast majority of the aneuploid embryos are not going to result in a pregnancy. So I'm curious on your thoughts. Wait, Kurt, can you go back? So when we say 5%, what were the absolute numbers there? Two out of 40. I mean, I think it's a low sample size. And I agree, like the conclusions are a little bit scary that those two were miscalled and could those two have had better reproductive potential. But I, I don't think that it negates the fact that we've saved 38 people from having transfers that would have resulted either in non-implantation or early pregnancy loss or ongoing aneuploidy. Like, I don't think you can take these data and just throw out the idea of PGT. I think that you have to take your interpretation with a healthy skepticism. But I wouldn't look at this and say, like, I'm not doing PGT anymore. Yeah, I would agree with that. I do think it's really interesting in terms of who is the appropriate candidate for PGT, because historically we think about this as most useful among patients who are going to have mostly aneuploid embryos. That said, the false positive for those patients is so much more impactful in terms of their long-term reproductive future and ability to have a child from their own egg. And so when you look at the data through this lens, it really does suggest that the best candidates for PGT are actually the patients who are going to make a ton of embryos and have a high proportion that are chromosomally normal because of what you say, Eve, because of the potential to limit the downside. And so, you know, it's such an, an interesting and evolving story and just really highlights the importance of patient counseling before, you know, we have people use this test. Yeah, I mean, I agree. If you have a 43-year-old who's only going to make three embryos, like PGT, at, at I think at its very core is a selection tool. And so if you have a 43-year-old who's going through IVF, I think that our knee-jerk reaction in present day is to say, let's find the normal embryo. But I think maybe we should be thinking about it as, let's not decrease your reproductive potential and call embryos not suitable for transfer that may actually have reproductive potential. And so are we thinking about this in the wrong way? Well, I want to call on one last rabbit hole on this paper. I want to call to attention the real schism and the bias that people have. I really was interested in reading this. And I read in the first paragraph, which should be a throwaway in every paragraph about why you're doing this study. It basically says next generation sequencing based on pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy is increasingly used in art, has been shown to optimize the chance of live birth per transfer and minimize the time to pregnancy while reducing the number of unsuccessful transfers, miscarriage and aneuploid pregnancy. That was a throwaway statement that had three references. All three of those references are inappropriate. One, one of them is a review article. One is an article that only looks at day three biopsies and 38-year-old and, and women in a randomized trial, in a, a very small randomized trial. And by the way, the finding is only in the first result. And it says right in the abstract, cumulative pregnancy rates at six months were no different. And the third paper did not find the difference in cumulative pregnancy rates with PGTA. And the difference in time to pregnancy was seven days. So people have bought this technology with very little data supporting the, a lot of the statements they're being made. So I just want to bring that out because it's an invasive technology. It's a costly technology. And 
I don't think we have definitive proof that this technology is actually helping women. Now, that's on a global basis. I know that I'm talking about public health, not on an individual basis. And and there's a lot of valuable in- information that each individual patient can get from this test. But I'm but I'm, but I'm curious on what your your take on this is when we review a paper like this. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with you, Kurt, that those statements that, as you say, is something of a throwaway and that we all take for granted as true, or many of us take for granted as true, they remain unproven. And so we need to individualize the the utilization of this. And it's really too bad that we can't go back to the start and validate it properly. That was a uh, fantastic discussion. And I, it's uh, great, Kurt, that you chose that as the seminal article. And yet, um, you know, so critical about, you know, the application of, of that and Kate, I hadn't really thought about it from the way you framed it, that what are we looking for in the predictive value of the test and what the test shows, and that may actually mean we're applying it to the wrong patient group. That was a, that was a great discussion. So everyone, go read the article, come up to your, your own conclusions. Definitely a, a very valuable seminal article this month in FNS. So we're going to move on now to the andrology section, and uh, I have this one. So the article is Association Between Self-Reported mobile phone use and semen quality in young men. So this is a observational epidemiologic study that was done by first author Raban and senior author Rusli from uh, the University of Geneva in Switzerland. And basically over 15 years, every young man in Switzerland has to report into the army for a physical fitness test and to see that they're they're fit for conscription if that's something that needs to happen. And out of these 100,000 men over uh, this time, 5,000 of them volunteered to do a health survey of a bunch of general health questions. And then another 2,800 gave a semen analysis. And so from this, they were able to have basically this decade and a half observational or cross-sectional study of how often uh, these young men were using cell phones and what their semen analyses were. Uh, And this also allowed them to sort of test whether there were associations that changed over time as cell phone technology and potential electromagnetic radiation from cell phones that might impact sperm quality, which is really what they're getting to, might have changed over time. So what did they collect to actually assess the exposure to cell phone? They collected how often a person used the phone per day, and they bend this to never one to five, five to 10, uh, 10 to 20, and greater than 20. So these five different bends. And then uh, sort of another way to measure an association was this, the, their cell phones. So the closest to where the sperm's being produced was the pant pocket. Uh, next was jacket pocket. And then the third was not on the body. So these two sort of ways were how they measured uh, any association of the exposure to the outcome, which was their sperm. So what did they find? There, there was no association with cell phone usage, with motility, morphology, or volume. But there was an association with the concentration, and the more you used your cell phone, the lower your concentration was, and total sperm count. And these were by about 30 million. So total sperm count, if you didn't use a cell phone, was 150 million. Uh, Total sperm count, if you used the cell phone or used it over 20 times, was 120. So decreased by 30 million, a big number, uh, but 150 versus 120, pretty much in the normal range. What I did like about this was they then broke that down more clinically. So this is an epidemiologic study, but clinically let's apply it to the WHO criteria for sperm. So how many men does this change into an abnormal classification? It was 21% for total modal sperm count. So your risk if you use the cell phone a lot uh, was 21% higher of having a WHO sperm count less than their definition. So 21% increase. Uh, They did not find any association with where you kept your phone on your body. So there's not really a dose effect that they saw, which you would hope to see if it truly is the radiation from the phone causing this. And also when you really parse it out, even though their abstract talks about those in that extreme cohort over 20 times a day, really, if you had any cell phone use, any of those other bins had uh, lower sperm counts. So any cell phone use was associated. So again, no, no real dose effect. And then interestingly, they did see that the effect weakened over time and they grouped their cohort into three bins of time, which were related to like 3G, 4G, 5G technology. And impressively, I didn't know this, but uh, the decrease in the electromagnetic radiation is hundreds of folds less as we go through these generations. So these phones are emitting much less energy than maybe they did early on. And they did see that the exposure, the association of cell phone use and low sperm decreased over time. So, Kurt, I, as a clinician, you know, I, I want to pick apart the article, but I, I channeled my inner Barnhart and let the epidemiologic science wash over me. And so what did I like about this article? 
they did a, a lot of really good things. Things. Like this is 15 year time frame. That's that's a long time frame. 3000 semen analyses. You can say, well, 3% of the whole population that's low for surveys. But when you start going down, I think, you know, 3000 observations over 15 years is good. They really, I, the, the methodologic reviewer really helped them improve the study. And then they, they did a great job of how they sort of talk about the potential for biases and why some might be likely and some aren't. And then they have very measured conclusions. They they don't say that cell phone use causes low sperm count. They say we observed an association. This should be confirmed in, in other studies, maybe prospective. And we can get into like how good their exposure actually is based upon how they've been it if we wanted to. Um, what did I not like about it? Or, or what were some of the things that I, you know, think about as I'm getting through this? Um, the fact that there was no dose effect seen, like in other words, going from one to five to five to 10 to 20, uh, we didn't see an effect where they're holding the cell phone isn't an effect. Kurt, if you and I were conscripted to the Swiss army at the same time, and you used your phone once and I used your phone once, my phone once, but you called your mom for a minute to just say, Hey, I'm doing good. And I watched four hours of YouTube cat videos. Is that the same exposure? Like maybe not. So we don't know how good the actual exposure is, but you know, it's the best proxy they had at the time. And then, you know, really my big thing as a clinician, I want to boil this down to clinical effects. So they say 30, uh, 21% increase in having an abnormal WHO. Well, abnormal WHO by definition is the fifth percentile. So that's 5% of men. A 21% relative increase means we have 6% of men. Uh, that means we have one additional out of every 100, even if this effect is real, having an abnormal WHO classification. And then we don't even really know if that means anything because those classifications are fertile men. So what this actually means clinically, I'm not sure. But before we get into the discussion, I Googled this this morning, the top hits, CNN, US News and World Report, uh, Health, and Forbes, cell phone use decreases sperm count in men, fertility and sterility in press November. So the press is already running away with it. I commend the authors for not overstating that, though. That's not the author's fault. They stated it correctly. And I really want to commend them for that. So I'll open this up for comments and discussion. Nice summary, Mike. I, I, you, you've learned so well on this podcast. I mean, the, 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 the epidemiology, it really, in my mind, just like it, it makes you think about it. There's, there's, you know, it's not a cause and effect. And and there's all sorts of reasons you could think that this might be true. Um, I, you know, people that are, you know, what what's the bias that could be used? But it's interesting to follow up. And it's interesting that, the, you know, now we need science on other environmental exposures for, for, for semen analyses. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing that I want to call out, and while the weight differences were not marked, we do know that there's an association between BMI and semen analysis. And in the heavy cell phone use, those males had a higher BMI that was found to be statistically significant. And so, you know, is it cell phone use? Is that, is BMI a confounder? Is there something else that may explain it? I don't really know. I, I looked at this, I thought, huh, interesting, food for thought, not really clinically relevant, but it's an important association to I think it's a think great about. comment, Eve, especially for fellows listening and looking at an epidemiologic report. So they have a nice diagram here of how they looked at all their covariates and exposures and how they interact. You mentioned obesity. Smoking was another one. Men who never use their cell phone smoke 16% of the time. Men who use their cell phone 20 times a day smoked double that, almost 33% of the time. So they're smoking and, and they're on their cell phone. Uh, that's obviously a confounder. What was interesting is that when they 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 did account for these as well as you can uh, using the data because they had that data, and they used a bunch of they did twenty multiple imputation models. Like they went through accounting for that. Those adjustments didn't change the uh, estimation of of the association at all. And so, at least in their judgment, for the confounders that they had, those weren't what was causing it. In my mind, there has to be a, a, an expo an association of covariate that's causing it, but I could be wrong. And this is why I'm letting the science wash over me and why I think it at least needs uh, publication and, and investigation. This is why you listen to the podcast. So now all you listeners can now talk to your relatives when they talk about semen analysis de is decreased with cell phone use at, at the Thanksgiving table or the holiday table. So you have all the talking points you need. Right. I was going to say the same thing. Perfect dinner conversation for Thanksgiving and also, uh, you know, for all of our patients that we see today who've been reading and watching CNN, we can tell them that that really the data are a little bit more reassuring than they would seem. Kate, we're staying within the world of andrology and you've got anabolic steroid use in men. 
Thanks, Micah. Yep. We're staying on the same theme of male reproductive health. And I'm going to be talking about a good paper that was entitled Fertility Outcomes in Men with a Prior History of Anabolic Steroid Use. This is from Dr. Ranjith Ramasamy's group at the University of Miami. And first author is Dr. Ledesma. You know, this is a retrospective cohort study. It really is a descriptive study when we think about what they're what they're able to report here. They evaluated 45 men who presented with infertility and a history of anabolic steroid use. And so they looked back over this cohort who were all treated the same way when they presented with this history. So each of these men was instructed to stop the testosterone. And again, they were instructed to stop the testosterone and started clomiphene citrate, so selective estrogen receptor modulator therapy in the hopes of increasing their FSH and HCG. And they had to have taken it consistently for a period of at least three to six months. Um, They did this over a time period of 2018 to 2022. And the median treatment time for these men was five months of treatment. The outcomes that the authors wanted to evaluate was their repeat semen analysis parameters. That was the primary outcome after this at least three to six months of therapy and cessation of exogenous testosterone. Then they also looked into what their fertility outcomes were and whether their partner became pregnant. That was a secondary outcome. The way they assessed that secondary outcome was via phone follow-up to the patients. And 24 out of the 45 patients did respond to the phone call. And so what did they find? In terms of their primary outcome of whether or not their semen analyses parameters improved, they looked at this in two main cohorts. First, they looked at those that had either severe oligospermia or azospermia. So there were 36 such men who they were able to obtain follow-up on. Um, And they defined severe oligospermia as less than 5 million sperm per milliliter. And then the second cohort they looked at were men who presented as azospermic at the initiation of the study period and at initiation of treatment. So at baseline of the men meeting their criteria, 51% were azospermic. So there were 18 in that group to evaluate as five of those were lost to follow up. So what they found was that in the main cohort, the main analysis of the 36 men who were either oligospermic or azospermic, about 30% improved their semen analysis, at least to the point where they were no longer severely oligospermic, but just oligospermic. So meaning five to 15 million uh, sperm per milliliter. Only six, about 17% recovered normal spermatogenesis. And unfortunately, 19 or 52% of the men remained azospermic or severely oligospermic. And then when they looked specifically at the group of men who presented as azospermic at the beginning, they found that about a third were able to regain some spermatogenesis, although they were severely oligospermic, so less than 5 million. And five men, unfortunately, in that azospermic group, so 28% remained azospermic. So they did not recover any spermatogenesis after having had that uh, median treatment time of five months. So, you know, I did find this to be a pretty interesting study in terms of the reproductive outcomes nine of the 24 who responded to the phone interview had achieved pregnancy. The very, it was very variable follow-up time given that the, they had their treatments between 2018 and 2022 and all had follow-up in March of 2023. And there may be some, a little bit of ascertainment bias or, or selection bias there in terms of who took the phone call, maybe those with more favorable reproductive outcomes. But what I took away from this um, in large part was that we need to be a little bit cautious in our counseling of men who present to us and say, you know, I've been on testosterone. I, for one, am often inclined to say, oh, it's completely reversible. Well, I don't know whether the study can answer the question of whether it's completely reversible or not, but what it does show is that if we don't know what their baseline reproductive function was before they started testosterone or what the underlying indication was for starting the testosterone in the first place, we can't say that they will uniformly recover spermatogenesis to the point of being able to conceive spontaneously. So I, for one, find this to be a helpful study for counseling, small study, some weaknesses that were 
were just intrinsic to the the data that they had and acknowledged by the authors or that they were not able to assess compliance. They really had a, a pretty heterogeneous group in the first place. And for me, the biggest point that I think we need to take into account when counseling our own patients is that why they needed to start testosterone or chose to start testosterone in the first place and what their prior fertility history was is pretty important. So I did have the chance to chat with my colleague who I manage most of my male fertility cases with about what he thought about this paper. And that's Dr. Paul Shin gave me his uh, you know, permission to, to invoke his name here today. And he shared a lot of the same thoughts that I had and found it to be a helpful study. He also was kind of interested in knowing nationally what's going on in terms of who is actually doing stimulation in these patients, who's giving a CIRM or gonadotropins versus just managing them expectantly. And so I w- wanted to hear from this group what your partners in male reproduction are doing and whether you're routinely seeing these patients started on Clomid and HCG. Yeah, I mean, I think it was a really good analysis of everything, we are managing them very similarly. And I think that what I think about is these are the patients that are presenting post-testosterone use to the fertility clinic who are running into trouble. What percentage of patients are on testosterone who have full recovery that never present to a male reproductive urologist? So I think this is probably likely an overestimation of percentages. But with that being said, like this is absolutely in line with my own close personal observation of these patients. I've seen many men who have been on testosterone therapy long term who quite simply have never recovered. And we often will similarly start them on Clomid, start them on HCG. And we've had many of these men who have had to go so far as have a TESI for sperm extraction because they just simply have remained azospermic in the ejaculate. And many of those men who have gone on to have TESIs do, in fact, have sperm production just at very low numbers. But we will keep them on HCG and Clomid for six to nine months prior to doing a TESI. That's super helpful. We do a similar thing, but... Actually, the HCG is so expensive that many, many patients are unable to afford it. So that's another potentially limiting factor. And then the other consideration around starting anything um, while we're waiting for spermatogenesis to resume is that the symptomatology for these men can be very intense. And so that's as much of a reason for many of our patients to not just stop cold turkey as really hastening or optimizing spermatogenesis is. Yeah, I think what I'm so intrigued by is how many men are started on testosterone at these pop-up urology clinics and how is that really managed from a counseling perspective when a male starts testosterone therapy. I feel like it's becoming so ubiquitous and the word on the street is like, oh, it's totally reversible. But I just, I think these data are really important to show that it may not be and that the side effects may have serious consequences. Eve, to that point, I was in uh, Dallas uh, in the last couple of years with a friend who went to a testosterone clinic. So I just Googled it, testosterone clinics of Dallas. There's 15 of them that say have testosterone in their name. And he, he really didn't have any testing other than showing up and saying, yeah, you know, I'm feeling older and libido. And, you know, there wasn't really counseling on fertility. And for this person, it, it wasn't an issue, but for a lot of these men, it is. And as a military physician, it's rampant. Like we've taken men for uh, emergency testy when there's no sperm in the ejaculate uh, and and even not had anything on that. And then they finally admit that they were abusing because of the pressure to perform for the military. Um, but it's out there. I mean, 15 clinics just in one metro area. That's a lot. Yeah, it does show that, that these quote unquote over the counter clinics are not innocuous. But I think the most important point that Kate made was you really don't know the reason they went there in the first place, right? So it's, it, you know, it's 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 like a woman asks you, you know, is my period going to go back to normal and I go off the pill? I go, I don't know. I don't know where your period was before you went on the pill. So it um, takes a little bit of a grain of thought here. Awesome. Eve, we're coming to you now with assisted reproduction, and we're going to be talking about estradiol levels and frozen embryo transfers. Thanks. I thought this was a really interesting paper. It was titled, Euploid Program Frozen Embryo Transfer Cycles Are Associated with a Higher Live Birth Rate When Estradiol Levels More Closely Mimic Physiology. And this was written by Nina Vias with senior author Steve Spandorfer from Cornell. 
This was a retrospective study at a single institution. The objective of this study was to determine whether peak estradiol levels above the physiologic range, and they define the physiologic range as 300 to 500 picograms per ml. And they wanted to see whether or not those high estradiol levels will impact programmed FET outcomes with first transfer of euploid embryos. They stratified patients into three groups. Group A was an estradiol of less than 300. Group B was an E2 of 300 to 500, and group 3 was an E2 of greater than 500. Primary outcome was live birth rate. Secondary outcomes were implantation rate and biochemical pregnancy rate, and they used group B as the reference for statistical analysis, so that physiologic group was the um, reference group. The study took place from January 2016 to December 2019, and they limited the study to autologous first transfer cycles, and they used program cycles for all patients. The group's standard protocol for program cycles was estrogen patches starting with one patch every other day, with stepwise increase to a total of four patches every other day. Patients were alternatively given oral estradiol if they had local reaction or they could not do patches for cost reasons. Lab and ultrasounds were performed at baseline, mid-cycle, and the day prior to embryo transfer. Progesterone was given as intramuscular, starting at 25 milligrams for the first dose and then 50 milligrams thereafter, and transfer was after the sixth dose of progesterone. They did adjust the number of patches based on estradiol levels, so they individualized it during monitoring. Peak estradiol was defined as the highest serum estrogen level obtained between baseline to the day of progesterone initiation. After mid-cycle scan, they only started progesterone with an estradiol of greater than 250. So what did they see? They included a total of 750 cycles. 41 patients were in group A, and I think largely because they adjusted those levels. They had 192 in group B and 517 in group C. There were 50 patients who had thin endometrial stripes in the group with an estradiol of greater than 500, and they removed these patients from the analysis so as to not have higher E2 levels as a surrogate marker for those who had an extremely thin endometrium. The findings I thought were interesting and not exactly what I would have expected. They saw the highest live birth rates in the reference group and lower live birth rates in both the low and the high estradiol groups. Specifically, Group B had a live birth rate of 63.4%, Group A had a live birth rate of 42.5%, and Group C had a live birth rate of 50.2%. And they saw a higher biochemical pregnancy rate in Group C compared to Group B. So I think it's an interesting study. It looks at a highly relevant clinical question. And I think at best we can say that there's probably a correlation between peak estradiol levels and live birth rate but I'm not yet willing to say based on these data that this is causative. The doses were adjusted based on peak levels and they weren't remeasured. So once they made that dose adjustment, they never remeasured the dose. And I think we also have to ask the question of whether peak estradiol is reflective of total estradiol exposure. I know in our program, we've looked at our own data comparing live birth rate in natural cycles versus program cycles, and we actually have not seen a difference in live birth rate between our different protocols. And I would say our natural cycles are all over the place with some using letrozole and some truly natural, and the estradiol levels in those letrozole cycles are pretty low, and we're seeing live birth rates of about 65% in this same population. But it does make me want to go back and for further analyze our euploid transfers and look again. And so I think my question uh, to you each is, are you surprised by the findings and, and what do you make of them? I, I'm not surprised because of the, the methodology and some of the limitations of the data. I think it's an important study, an important question. Um, that said, given that the um, estradiol administration was adjusted when a thin lining was noted, I think that's a pretty difficult covariate to account for in this analysis. And so I think that in this study, uh, though doing their best to control for it, um, to have a high estradiol may be a marker for, for a thinner lining. Yeah, I mean, they did. So there were 500 patients that they excluded from the analysis. So they took out those patients. But where I really struggled with it, so two things. One is 
what percentage of the patients were their like standard estradiol group and what were the, um, you know, they have patches versus versus oral estradiol. And in my experience, and I think that of most others, you automatically are going to have higher levels in the oral administration compared to the patches. And they didn't really break that part down. But I mean, I, I think it's really hard when you're adjusting the levels and then you're not remeasuring it. So you're going off one estradiol level at one point in time. And I think that how does that relate to the timing of the monitoring visit, um, especially when you're taking oral estradiol with patches, you expect to see a much more um, consistent dosing over time. But in those patients that are on oral estradiol, are you catching it at a peak or a trough? And is that truly reflective of the total exposure over time? So I think interesting. I think I'd be curious to see if other centers have similar findings. I know we've looked at this in multiple different ways to see whether or not there's a best protocol for transfer. And we have not been able to show any differences between program cycles, natural cycles, natural stimulated cycles, or modified natural cycles, et cetera. So I think to me, this is just interesting, but it's not going to change what I do or how I practice. I think there's something there, Eve. I, I, I think the, the data is a little bit too noisy and it's hard to study this to get the answer, but I think it's worth studying this. I mean, um, it wouldn't surprise me that there is one protocol that's better than another in some circumstances. So open the floodgates. Let's get more study about this. I, I agree with you. This is, I'm not ready to change my practice based on this one, but this is showing you where we should be looking. This, this is ripe for research. Well said. And uh, Eve, we're sticking with you. So I think our readers, by our listeners by now certainly know that Eve is a, a program director and a lot about um, medical education, fellow education, resident education is near and dear to her heart. So this is actually uh, an article that you're the senior author on and Pietro selected this article and asked actually for you to uh, tell us about it since you're the one that did the research. Yeah, so this was a really interesting and fun project to do. So the title of this paper is, Do Gender Differences Exist in Letters of Recommendation for Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility Fellowship? So Kate Bolton is the first author. She was my stellar mentee um, when she was a third-year medical student at Northwestern when we began this study. And Kate's now a first-year resident in OBGYN at OHSU, and I'm truly hoping a future REI fellow. So this study really came about from close personal observation of reading many, many letters of recommendation. And what I witnessed time and time again is that women applicants were being described very differently than male applicants. And I was disturbed by it. I noticed the use of the word drama again and again in our applicants' letters. And what I wanted to do was not to just have a hunch that these letters were different, but I really wanted to objectively analyze whether there were true gender differences in letters of recommendation for REI fellowship applicants. How would you use drama in a letter? Like there are no drama, so almost like a reverse compliment or uh, what do you mean exactly. as far as how they use that word? Exactly. So in one of our tables, we actually put the actual phrases from the letters of recommendation in there. And I'll give you two examples. So one theme was this idea of no drama. And here are two examples. The first is XX is how we de-identify them. But XX is a great physician with great work ethic who, best of all, comes with no drama. That's one comment. The second is XX is mature, free of drama, academically talented, with a stellar work ethic. And we never had a single letter to this day. I've never seen a single letter who talks about a male applicant as drama free. Great. Thank you so, for clarifying and explaining that for me. Yeah, so prior data, as many are aware, prior data published by the AAMC have showed that only 16% of medical school deans, 18% of department chairs, and 25% of full professors are women. And additionally, data published by Jessica Selter showed that in our field um, of REI, women hold less than one-third of director division and fellowship director roles, despite now equal proportions of men and women in practice. And so what we did is we used ERAS and NRMP data, and we were able to determine that in that year that we were conducting the study, 2021, 100% of all applicants in 100% of all applicants applying to REI fellowship programs applied to Northwestern. 
And therefore, we felt that we had a robust sample of letters that we could analyze. So we chose a mixed methods approach using a quantitative approach using something called linguistics inquiry word count. And then we also used a qualitative approach using thematic coding of each individual letter. So there were 72 applicants with a total of 272 letters of recommendation. Gender information is captured in the application, and we did exclude one applicant for gender non-disclosure. So the final analysis was carried out on 71 applicants with a total of 269 letters of recommendation, with most applicants submitting four letters. We had 54 applicants were women and 17 were men, and 110 letters were written by women and 159 were written by by men. And so we analyzed the letters by both the gender of the applicant as well as the gender of the letter writer. And letter writer genders were pulled from public profiles. So quantitative linguistics inquiry was performed using a, using a computer program called Linguistic Inquiry Word Count, or LIWC, which is a widely used validated text analysis software programs. Letters were also then qualitatively coded using deduce. So we used a total of 18 codes that included things like altruistic behaviors, doubt raisers, future promise, honors and awards, surgical skills, personality traits, teamwork, leadership, and others. And we went through each letter and highlighted where each word, um, what code that fell into. And then we analyzed Um, we analyzed it by code. And so what we found was that our findings showed that gender bias was seen on both quantitative and qualitative analysis. Our quantitative analysis showed that letters for men had higher word counts compared to letters written for women, 537 versus 474. There were no differences by gender in the letter writers. Letters written for women applicants had a greater degree of analytic thinking compared to letters written for men, but there were no differences in categories um, for other types of tone. And then when we looked at word categories, letters of recommendation for men had more words containing differentiation um, and risk, whereas women letter writers used more things like communal words that were relationship-oriented, more about affect, whether or not this applicant was happy, sweet, Um, and home words, while men letter writers used more affiliation words. The most common codes that were applied overall, irrespective of gender, were research and achievements. Letters for men applicants were more likely to comment on things like teamwork and leadership, and letters for women applicants were more likely to contain disclosures about elements of the candidate's personal life and parenthood status. The final paragraph of letters for men were more likely to have strong endorsements and guarantee a future promise, whereas more letters for women were classified as unusually short, which was assigned as a code when the letter was approximately six sentences or contained persistently terse nondescript language that fails to individualize the applicant. Language coded as doubt raisers, and we've got several examples of these in that same uh, table, were twice as likely to appear in letters for women applicants. Language was identified that was not only used to describe women such as drama-free or things like lack of complaining or not easy to fluster, and that was not observed in letters for men applicants. So again, the study was designed based on a hunch, based on my own personal observations of language differences in letter of recommendation. I will say it was an incredibly tedious project to pick apart 272 letters by code, and also to de-identify and code each letter sentence by sentence. I'm totally biased, but I think it's an important study, and it does call attention to how we write letters of recommendation. And I really view this as a call to action to raise awareness and to educate letter writers to focus on abilities and strengths and not to perpetuate gender norms in letters of recommendation. Eva, it was such a cool study and a great example of something that a resident can do with just data that's available at a, at a program. You you looked at it primarily as the applicant's gender being the outcome or, you know, or the exposure. But as far as the letter writer itself, I know you adjusted for that in your models. And in some places, you at least one place, you said there was no interaction. I was just curious how much the gender of the letter writer themselves might have influenced it. In other words, does male to male have even more of an interaction in, in misusing those terms as compared to female to female? Uh, did you see yeah, anything we, in that from looked, a letter writer standpoint? 
We did. So the most egregious were male letter writers writing about females. Sorry, guys. (laughs) I tried to be as objective as possible with this. But I will tell you, as somebody who collectively has read thousands upon thousands of letters of recommendation, that this is a problem. And I think that, you know, what we tried to do was we tried to look at it as objectively as we can with this mixed methods methodology, looking at a computer program that looks at these objective measures of things like tone. And then we also picked it apart. And I'm just going to give you a couple, um, just a couple examples. So, um, you know, parenthood. Okay. There were um, mentions of parenthood in women applicants, and we did not see mentions of parenthood in men applicants. So here's one example. So, so and so worked hard as a resident despite balancing two young daughters and a multi generational household. Only after so and so's children were old enough did they now decide to pursue the REI fellowship. Whereas, like, we just did not see that in the men applicants. And so I think my advice to my advice to letter writers is to really look at what you're trying to say, how you're trying to convey an applicant's strengths and stick to accomplishments, stick to research, stick to leadership and leave out elements of personal life, parenthood and other disclosures. Oh, no, I love the objective approach that you took to this. And it's so important. I mean, the thing that we all know on this on this call and listening in the audience is that this is not, for the most part, intentional, right? These are these are unconscious biases that need to be brought to light and into consciousness. And I, I do think that, you know, this goes as a small step towards progress for um, alerting our readership to really being more egalitarian in the way that we recommend people to to our field. Yeah. So what's funny is long before this paper was published, August 20th, I got a text from a colleague at another institution who was reading a letter of recommendation that I had written. And I will say like writing this paper helped me to become a better letter writer. (laughs) And so I got this text. Your letter for so-and-so is excellent. Really feel like I understood her as a person and as a future fellow. Also, I personally learned a lot about how to write a good letter, unprompted text. (laughs) But I do, I think that, I think that we can take some of these tangible elements and apply them to how we collectively write letters of recommendation. I think for me, like I used to, as a program director, I used to look at the letter of recommendation as one of the most important parts of the application. And I, put less stock in them now. As I do it, I I just think that they have more bias than we probably realize. So Eve, congratulations again. This is a, an eye-opening letter, but I'll, I'll end with, um, I'm pleased we can publish it in Fertility and Serility, but you don't think this is just REI. You think this is um, probably in all aspects of medicine and maybe even all aspects of business. I do. I don't think it's unique to us at all. And in fact, part of how we researched what methodology to use, there are other papers that are out there that are cited in here that have done similar analyses in other fields. What I think is so shocking, though, is this is a field where it's women's health. So I would have I would have hoped that we would have perhaps seen less gender bias in a field that takes care of women, but it just wasn't the case. Awesome. Thank you, Eve, for that uh, great contribution and discussion. It's nice when uh, we have the author on to be able to talk to us about it as well. So I have our last uh, original research uh, article here on reproductive surgery. Uh, And this was one that Pietro was going to be talking about uh, as as one of our surgical experts uh, on this panel. Uh, This is an RCT of hysteroscopic morcellation versus curatage for removal of retained products of conception, a multi-centered randomized trial. Uh, This is from first author Wagener and senior author Van Viet from uh, the Netherlands. And as the title says, this is an RCT. And it's uh, randomizing patients into either electronic ultrasound guided vacuum aspiration or hysteroscopic morcellation for retained products of conception or retained products of pregnancy. And this could be for a variety of reasons. They could have had a spontaneous pregnancy loss. 
Uh, they could have had a termination with incomplete evacuation. They could have postpartum retained products of conception. So anything that had re, uh, retained products of pregnancy was uh, randomized in this trial. Uh, an important part here in the study design, and we'll talk about the generalizability at the end of this as far as how they designed it. If you had vacuum guided uh, vacuum aspiration, ultrasound guided vacuum aspiration, you could have the procedure immediately. So you're diagnosed, you're in clinic, we have spot, we'll do it today, we'll do it tomorrow. So essentially immediate treatment. Hysteroscopic morselation, they waited eight weeks uh, for the people, the half of the cohort or the half of the trial randomized to that arm. And the reason they waited eight weeks, uh, they cite two studies that show that uh, there might be patients that have rapid fluid loss during hysteroscopy uh, or any incomplete evacuation of pregnancy contents. Uh, so based on these two studies they cite, they uh, if you're randomized in the morselation arm, you had to wait eight weeks. And then because of hospital policy, because they waited eight weeks, they had to first undergo a separate surgery that was hysteroscopic confirmation that there was still retained products before they could undergo the second surgery. So if you randomized the hysteroscopy arm, you have two surgeries, uh, one eight weeks later to confirm you still have retained products, and then a follow-up one to remove those products. So what did they find? Uh, for their overall outcome, which was adhesions, it was similar between the two groups, 14% at uh, two-month post-op hysteroscopy versus 17% in the vacuum arm. So relatively similar, around 15% chance of having adhesions regardless of which arm you are randomized to. There were similar complications in both arms, roughly three to four in each arm, uh, about 3%, uh, and none of those were serious, very rarely resulting in hospitalization. Unsurprisingly, hysteroscopy was definitive 95% of the time and uh, vacuum 82% of the time, meaning hysteroscopic morselation was more likely to not require coming back again. But they did use hysteroscopic morselation as the gold standard. So if you failed in the vacuum arm, that's what you ended up getting to remove it. And not surprisingly, it took a little bit longer to do it in the OR uh, by about two minutes to do hysteroscopic. So overall, there's really no difference between these two arms in the primary outcomes. The only difference is that if you underwent vacuum, you were more likely to need definitive surgery than if you underwent definitive surgery. So uh, just a couple comments from the authors. There were 6% of patients in the vacuum arm that passed their pregnancy, the contents before they had their vacuum procedure done that day or the next day. That was 12% when they waited eight weeks. The authors say that that, even though it's not statistically significant, justifies that you should wait eight weeks before doing the procedure because some patients will pass it. Now, if you talk about the absolute number, you're talking about two patients. And if you're talking about two patients, the number needed to pass it spontaneously is going to be, you know, pretty low to make them wait eight weeks. So I don't know that I completely agree with that. I would say this ultimately was a null study, uh, but the authors in their very final sentences conclude that uh, because hyster hysteroscopy was more likely to be definitive because it's the definitive procedure, therefore that should be the first line is to make have patients wait eight weeks and then do the definitive procedure. I would argue that the whole point we have definitive surgeries is that they tend to be more invasive. They tend to be the most aggressive options we have. And the whole point of intervening procedures is to have something that's more cost-effective, more patient-friendly, quicker, doesn't require the OR, doesn't require as much anesthesia. There's a lot of reasons why. So I don't think saying that because the definitive procedure is definitive, it should be first line makes sense to me. And I, I don't think this data support that. But overall, a nice trial. I do think that the fatal flaw with all RCTs is going to be generalizability. Kate and I just did the trial on the ERA, and it's in good prognosis patients. It didn't seem to be helpful. We can't generalize that to recurrent implantation failure or other patients. In this case, is it standard of care to wait eight weeks to remove retained products of conception? If anything, I think that biases against the hysteroscopy arm because they're probably going to be at potentially increased risk of infection and other things that could happen during the intervening eight weeks. And I just don't know that it's patient friendly. So ultimately, I don't agree with the authors. And I don't know that this is generalizable to how most of us practice, uh, but otherwise a, a very nicely designed uh, and, and reported RCT. Questions or comments on that one? Mike, I've been fascinated by this debate we've had in medicine, and I can name multiple constructs on whether you do definitive surgery up front or whether you wait to see what happens. And um, I, I think it's, I guess it's independent based on I don't want to make a generalization. I'm sure it depends on which disease process you're talking about. But the more I learn, the more I think you probably should not be aggressive at first. Because uh, I learned from my mentor, Steve Sonheimer, it's easier to be a surgeon than a tailor because the body tries to heal itself. 
I think you summarized it extremely well, Micah. It's a it's a helpful study in many ways. On the other hand, you know this this particular pathophysiology, the approach to it is kind of an art, right? And we we select patients intentionally for one procedure versus the other based on the specific presentation, both ultrasonographically in terms of time, in terms of whether it's their first one or not. So I couldn't agree with you more that, it, you know, we probably would not be randomizing patients um, to one thing or the other in real life. So it doesn't quite mimic our clinical practice. Yeah. I mean, I, I totally agree. And I think what was interesting about this was it was a an MVA as opposed to like randomizing somebody to a vacuum DNC versus a hysteroscopy. And what I've observed in our local practice patterns is our OBGYNs will often, if they have retained products, they'll take somebody back to the OR and they'll do a DNC, which I think like this really shows that if you're going to take somebody back to the operating room, you probably should just do a hysteroscopic evacuation. But this really gives a nice intermediate option of that um, MVA in the interim. So I, I thought you summarized it really well. Awesome. So for all our listeners, if you have randomized clinical trial data, send it to Fertility and Sterility. We we want it. This and other articles. I just want to give my uh, monthly shout outs. So the first one is to an embryologist, Eva Shankman. So uh, she replied to our LinkedIn advertising of FNS on air yesterday and said, do you guys do this every month? And I said, yes. And she said, that's awesome. I'm going to spread the word. So thank you, Eva, for spreading the word to the embryologists uh, around the country and around the world. My second shout out is to David Sable. So at the start of this, I tweeted that Kate was joining our team today. And I'm going to misquote him because I don't have it up on my phone, but he essentially says Kate adds a powerhouse to this team. And this is a must listen for anyone in, in reproductive medicine. So thank you, David, for that shout out about Kate. And we're happy to have Kate. So we're recording this episode uh, on the Monday before Thanksgiving. So I just want to know what each person's favorite holiday food is as we close out and wish a, a happy holidays to our listeners. I'll go around my screen. Eve, I'll start with you. What's your favorite holiday food? Cranberry sauce, like made from scratch super sour, very tart, and uh, kind of crunchy. Classic. Kate, what about you? Brussels sprouts roasted with extra garlic. <laughs> Vegetables. Love it. <laughs> Kurt? <laughs> the turkey gravy, because then you can put on anything, on all things. <laughs> you could put it on the cranberry sauce and the Brussels sprouts. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Uh, mine is the smoked meat. Give it turkey, ham, prime rib. If you're really in the mood to smoke something nice, give me the smoked meats. Have a happy holiday to all of our listeners. Uh, we look forward to a wonderful year upcoming in 2024. This concludes our episode of Fertility and Sterility on Air, brought to you by Fertility and Sterility in conjunction with the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. This podcast is produced by Dr. Molly Cornfield and Dr. Adriana Wong. This podcast was developed by Fertility and Sterility and the American Society for Reproductive Medicine as an educational resource and service to its members and other practicing clinicians. While the podcast reflects the views of the authors and the hosts, it is not intended to be the only approved standard of practice or to direct an exclusive course of treatment. The opinions expressed are those of the discussants and do not reflect Fertility and Sterility or the American Society for Reproductive Medicine.